display a broken economic system. In our second gospel reading that Vicar Adam read, we see a broken economic system because the fact of the matter is if the people who made your latte this morning at Starbucks made the same as the CEO, that company would fail. If the simple electronic technicians for Microsoft made the same as Bill Gates, we wouldn't know what Microsoft is. A system where everyone gets paid equally regardless of time worked is a broken system. In Acts chapter 4, we see a broken system where all people held everything in common, where there was no such thing as mine, but it was ours. It was yours. The early church understood this radical generosity of holding all things in common. I want you to think for a moment what that would look like today. Just how countercultural and, and revolutionary and invigorating that would be. Something certainly for us to strive for. What's mine truly is yours without limit. But the text for our sermon today is going to be from our first gospel reading from Matthew chapter 18. Jesus' parable of the king and his servants. As we examine this text, it makes me think that in this world, there are two kinds of bankers. Do we have any bankers in the, in the, in the sanctuary? No? That's okay, don't raise your hand. In this world, we have two kinds of bankers. There are good bankers, and there are bad bankers. Now, we like the good bankers, I'll explain why, but we don't like bad bankers, and I'll explain why. There are good bankers in this world, and sometimes you get to meet them on big moments. One of the most incredible days in a person's life is probably the day that they close on a new home. And I know it's incredible because now I've done it twice, one of them being last Thursday. And it's, it's incredible. And even if you haven't bought a home, like, you can probably imagine what it's like. You're sitting there in a room with a, your realtor, with the lender, or you might say banker, with someone from the title company, and in most normal states, with the seller. We found out in Missouri you don't actually meet the seller at the closing. That's weird to me. But anyway. And you're about to close on a house. You're about to make one of the biggest decisions of your entire life. Your palms might be a little sweaty. That pen feels heavy as you sign your name countless times. Your, your hand might be shaking as you're handing over the down payment, whether it's 5, 10, 20 percent, because that's the biggest check you might ever write in your life. It's a big moment. It's a huge life change because a huge debt is about to fall into your lap. A mortgage, which for most of us, unless maybe you study to become a doctor or a lawyer, will be the largest debt you will ever own. It's a big deal. And on that day when a huge debt falls into your lap, you can appreciate a good banker. You like them. Because you see, as some of you know, when you close on a house, you get a huge pile of papers, and one of them is an amortization statement. A paper that says exactly how and when that debt will be paid off. That if you are faithful and if you are frugal, you can pay that debt off. In 30 years, that debt will be gone and it's all laid out for you. And you see how much will go to principal and how much will go to interest. And that's really a little unsettling for those first 10 years, isn't it? Gosh. But the point is, you can see exactly, through the help of a good banker, you can see exactly how that debt will be paid off. They've made a way. A good banker, granted it's in their own self-interest, but they have made a way for you to pay off your debt. Just like with a car or with student loans, a good banker makes a way. And in fact, you can pay it off even sooner. Now, the banker won't like this much because you're eating into the interest that they live on. But you can pay extra into the principal. You can pay that 30-year debt off in 20 years or 15 years or 10 years or you hit the lottery and you pay it off tomorrow if you're smart. 
There is a way with a good banker to pay off your debts, even the largest. And I think that's how most people want God to be. Most people, even maybe some of us, want God to be a good banker. We want God to have sound economic principles. Because if God is a good banker, my behavior matters. If God is a sound banker, my faithfulness counts for something. And of course, part of this is because we're human and we think that our good behavior is good anyway. As we hear in scriptures, all my good works are like filthy rags. But, but we as humans, as people, we like to think that we have a hand in paying off the debt we owe God. That we have something to do with the admission fee to be in his family, to be in his kingdom. That we have something to do with the eternal life that he offers. It gives us power <coughs> to think that our faithfulness with our mutual funds, our faithfulness with our spiritual stock options, that our choices for our eternal retirement 401k actually matter. We like to think that it matters how diligent we've been, how often we've come to church, how many good works we do, how much we think of other people. We want to think that it matters, and maybe even like with a mortgage, we think that we can make up for lost time, that we can even pay it off early. We can make some lump payments. You know, maybe in my 20s, <laughs> I fell away, but now that I'm wiser and in my 40s, I'll really pay it forward. Kind of like getting your tax return and putting it all into the principle of your mortgage. I can do it if I try hard enough. And I know we're Lutheran, so we're all about that grace alone. So maybe we agree that salvation really does belong to God, but we still want to think that what we do matters. We have some kind of hand, we have some power in this matter. That maybe a few extra deposits will make our account a little bit bigger than someone else's. I think that part of the reason we think this way, part of the reason that we want, and all of us, myself included, that we want some agency in our salvation, that we want our actions to matter, is that I don't know that we actually understand how serious our situation is. Whether it's us or others out in the world who want something to do with it, we don't actually think about just how big this debt is. We don't often count our sins. We don't look at the evidence stacked against us. The admission fee to God's family is much higher than any of us could pay. And it could be as simple as looking at confession on Sunday mornings. We confess our sins, but how often does it turn into a boring, ho-hum confession? Something that we do because it's routine, something that's simple because it's printed for us in the bulletin. How much do we actually look inside? Because if there is an all-powerful creator who expects and demands perfection to be a part of his family, we're dead to rights. We could never borrow enough money to pay it off. We can't do enough good things to pay off our evil thoughts and actions. We can't love enough to erase the hate we have a massive debt to be a part of this family, and you can't consolidate. You can't transfer this debt to a lower interest rate. There's no refinancing of sins and brokenness. We're just simply in default. There's just no way. Now, a good banker, a good banker would write out a payment plan, even if it was unattainable. A good banker would work out a way that, even though it's unrealistic, would give us a blueprint to paying for our debts. That sounds nice to us. But a bad banker, a bad banker simply cancels them. 
takes the power out of our hands. And sometimes that's exactly why we don't necessarily love a bad banker. Because it takes the power from us. Jesus said that therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one of his servants was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. So he still thought he could do it himself. But out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Wiped it away. Now the primary reason that Jesus tells this parable is to teach us how to forgive as we've been forgiven. It's, it's related to the question that Peter asks, how often must I forgive my brother? So it's mostly about our discipleship and how we forgive as we've been forgiven. But when we look at just this passage with this king, we actually do the math. This fellow had 10,000 talents forgiven. 10,000 talents. Now you might be thinking, I have no idea what that means. So I'll try to explain. A denarii is a day's wage in Jesus' time. You work for a day, you get a denarii. So in a given year, how many denarii, denarii would you get? Well, you take out the Sabbath, you don't work on the Sabbath. Maybe a few other holidays or your birthday, like Beth, you don't work. So maybe 300 denarii a year you would earn, which means that in 20 years, mom, dad, how many? They're mathematicians, sorry. 6,000 denarii. In 20 years, working 30 days a year, 300 days a year, you would make 6,000 denarii. You know what that's worth? Based on what I've found, one talent. One talent is 20 years of labor. So this fellow, if you do the math, <laughs> something like 200,000 years of labor forgiven. Now obviously that's an exorbitant amount, and Jesus is using it to illustrate the difference in what God has done for us and what we do for one another. But if this parable were changed, if the metaphor were changed to being a banker, not a king, the banker that made that decision to wipe out all of that debt, he wouldn't have a job for very long. Because his boss would say, you wiped out all that debt, i got to fire you. If that banker was the boss, that bank would not be in business for very long. Because you can't go around forgiving debts. That's not how businesses operate. Those are terrible economics. Those are broken economics. You can't be a successful banker and forgive debt. But that is our God. That is the Holy Trinity. That's his economy of salvation. He cooked the books in your favor. The whole debt has all been forgiven because God is truly a lousy banker. When we get past our pride and our desire to have a hand in things, that's really, really good news. The debt's just gone. None of it shows up on your spiritual credit history. None of your defaults, none of your missed payments from your 20s. None of your spiritual bankruptcies when you walked away from the faith for a time. None of it. Every sin you've ever confessed is just gone. There is no debt. Even the sins you don't know about. All of your unspoken resentments of your spouse, forgiven. All of your unholy romantic encounters, they're gone. Your graceless parenting, your pride and your vanity are erased. Your greed is absolved. God, economics are broken. He is a truly awful banker. And that's really the best news that we could ever hear. And the thing is, that God the Father also expects you to be a bad banker as well. He expects you to be a truly lousy debt collector. That you would operate, that I would operate, that we would all operate with the same broken economics. 
And consider how Jesus teaches us to pray. How Jesus teaches us to live through that prayer. Now in the older language, of course, it says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So the question is, how good are we? How good are you with the books? How accurate of an account do you keep for the relationships in your life? For your spouse, your parents or children, your neighbors, even those who have wronged you in the worst ways imaginable? Are you good at holding grudges? Are you good at keeping score? Do you keep good books? Are you a good banker or are you a bad banker? Do you forgive debts as you have been forgiven? Are we quick to wipe the slate clean and leave it that way? Probably not always. We have work to do. As we bear the image of our God, as we live in the economy of the Trinity's salvation, as we work and as we grow, the good news is he will even forgive your shortcomings in the banking department. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors, he has. He always will. And we, as his disciples, we will try. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.